Let's return to the decisions first of spring of 1885. After Rodolfo's agreement with the SGI, the work of demolishing the villa commenced almost immediately. And the reason this is all worth discussing uh, is it's interesting in itself, but it's also a window into a much larger phenomenon, something that was happening with uh, many noble estates uh, in and around Rome at this point. Starting in May of 1885, hordes of workmen began carting off the numerous ancient artifacts of the Villa Ludovisi in preparation for what would be a frenzy of excavation and building. In fact, the ground level was taken down some 20 feet uh, from the uh, uh, pre-existing level of the villa. And the felling of the villa's magnificent trees apparently started on the 12th of June, 1885, uh, to judge from a um, contemporary oil painting by Guglielmo Mangiarelli, which uh, commemorates this dubious event. The French painter Ernest Hebert expressed his deep dismay at the modernizing destruction of Rome in uh, the uh, disgraced Rome. Hebert had started a second term as the director of the French school at Rome in June of 1885, and he remained in that position until 1896. So he looked on from the Villa Medici at the dismantlement of the nearby, or in fact neighboring Villa Ludovisi from start to finish. Well, the international outcry was near instantaneous, with the sale and the development of the Villa Ludovisi attracting, I think, universal condemnation by academics, journalists, poets, and, and visual artists. It would take some effort to make a full collection of contemporary or near-contemporary reactions. There were a lot in prose and poetry, but perhaps the most famous and evocative description of the destruction of the Villa Ludovisi is found in Gabriele D'Annunzio's 1895 novel, The Virgin of the Rocks, where the narrator conjures up the sad state of affairs as it stood in November of 1885. Quote, the gigantic Ludovisi cypresses, those of the aurora, the very same which had once spread the solemnity of their ancient mystery over the Olympian head of Goethe, lay on the ground. I see them always in imagination as my eyes saw them one November afternoon. Side by side in a row they lay, with the smoke from their naked roots rising up to the pale heaven above, with their black roots all laid bare, and seeming still to hold prisoner within their vast intricacies the phantom of omnipotent life. He continues, And those lordly meadows all around, where only one spring ago violets more numerous than the blades of grass were springing up for the last time, were now ghastly with white lime pits, red heaps of bricks, the creaking of cartwheels loaded with stones, while the shouts of the master builders alternated with the hoarse cries of the carters and the brutal work which was to occupy places so long sacred to beauty and visions went on rapidly. It seemed as though a blast of barbarism was blowing over Rome and threatening to tear away that radiant crown of patrician villas incomparable in the world of memories and poetry. But let's now turn to an account nearer the event itself, that letter from Hermann Grimm on the destruction of Rome, dating to the end of January 1886. He talks about how he returned to Rome after an absence of 10 years, and he saw how depressing it was to see how the city, when it was transformed into the capital of modern Italy, well, that the danger was of effacing the old Rome. In particular, uh, the d very distinctive ring, a green ring that surrounded the historical city center, and that green ring was bounded, in turn, by the Aurelian walls of the um, third century A.D. Roman Emperor Aurelian. Well, quote, what they've now begun to do is to convert this entire circuit of inner Rome into inhabitable districts, where the houses at some future day are to reach out in every direction to the walls of Aurelian. In many places, the new streets are already laid out and cover the garden plots of inner Rome. Grimm talks about how this, in fact, had been foreseen since, in fact, May of 1882, when a bill had been passed uh, that uh, allowed for changes uh, in the extent of the city. And um, Grimm remarks how the what he calls reservoirs of pure air during the sultry summer months in Rome, in other words, the, the green belt that 
in his words, afforded shade, coolness, and refreshment. Well, um, how, in fact, these were eradicated. He says, the Villa Ludovisi lies, or we must say today did lie, at the eastern end of the city, at the Porta Salara, and it reached to the Aurelian walls, which, overhung with ivy, formed its boundary to the east. The most delightfully shady avenues of laurel and home oak, interspersed with pines, tall and broad, the balsamic air, the repose which reigned there, well, made the Ludovisi Villa, into which it was not always easy to gain admittance. One of the places in Rome first named when the enchantment of the eternal city was talked of. Indeed, I believe that if in regard to the whole earth the question had been put, which is the most beautiful garden? The answer from all those who had ever known Rome would instantly have been the Villa Ludovisi. He continues, Among the ideas associated in the minds of connoisseurs or lovers of old Rome... With the conversion of the city into the capital of Italy was the hope that these grounds, with their superb garden houses filled with pictures and statues, would pass into the public possession, and only to be made more accessible to the people. A prophecy that, under the new regime, this villa would be destroyed, as it has been, its laurels, oaks, and pines felled, as I've seen them, would have been treated as a suggestion too insulting and ridiculous for the bitterest enemy of the new kingdom to dare to give it utterance. Ingram asks, how have these grounds been destroyed today? He says, well, there was no talk here of public necessity. It is only said that the fate of the villa was decided when the land became so valuable that the Ludovisi family could be paid for it, the number of millions they demanded. Then he asks, to whom have these gardens been sold? How are they to be built over? Well, according to that plan of 1882, it was not proposed to hurry on the work at such a rate. The changes were to go on gradually. The building and general style of the houses was to be more dignified, and only with consideration for the needs of the growing city. The startling feature in the present change in the manner of building is the sudden eruption of things monstrous. A number of moneyed corporations, as I said, have bought large tracts of land and undertaken to cover them with houses. The building ground in every direction has been utilized to the very last inch. Houses immoderately high, crowded close upon one another, and many instances filled with tenants in the upper stories while the lower ones are still unfinished, for the most part devoid of architecture, but wherever architecture appears, presenting all the features noticeable in buildings of a like kind elsewhere. This is the character of the houses which, within and without the Porta Solara, have sprung, we may truly say, with feverish haste, out of the ground and of such as will also, in too short a time, cover the grounds of the Villa Ludovisi. He continues, I should have been well justified in drawing the conclusion that this destruction of the Villa Ludovisi was an example of what beyond dispute is to be termed vandalism. But don't let us be unjust to the vandals who have, through simple unconsciousness, ruined the property of strangers. The vandals neither destroyed for the sake of making money nor let loose their passion for destruction on their own household goods, but trespassed upon and injured the possessions of others whose value they were incapable of estimating. On the other hand, says Grimm, the people who have made money by the ruin of the Villa Ludovisi, however, can scarcely pretend to have been ignorant of the significance which was attached to this, the fairest spot on earth. In reply to what I say, the question may be put whether mourning over the trees in the Villa Ludovisi and complaining of these modern vandals will undo what is done. And what use there is, after all, is over in branding with a stigma, deeds committed more through ignorance than from any evil intention. Well, my feeling towards the Italians, says the German Grimm, has ever been only that of gratitude and affection. Their mode of thinking corresponds to ours, that is the Germans, however great the differences may appear to be. The way in which they are bravely struggling upward today inspires our respect, while the difficulties with which they contend enlist our sympathy. Dante, Michelangelo, and Raphael will forever unite the German people in spirit with the Italian. But trying days may come to them such as we earlier have experienced and all nations experience. And should the talk in those days again turn upon Rome, the eternal city, we should hear a voice reply coldly, the world knows 
that the Italians themselves destroyed Rome at the close of the 19th century. Well, it's interesting to walk through what is today known as the Rione Ludovisi, in addition to the Villa Aurora, which is miraculously uh, intact, and a bit of the Palazzo uh, uh, Grande of the Boncampagna Ludovisi, and of course the large late 19th century um, uh, palazzo that they built on the Via Veneto, about which more in a second. Um, there's not much that one can actually see. Of course, the bits of the Aurelian Wall, if one looks hard, and in fact, set, for example, in the um, Aurelian Wall is this Fons Ludovicia. That's what the inscription says. It's apparently a 20th century creation, early 20th century, that utilized bits and pieces from the old Villa Ludovici. The location of the fountains at a, in a niche of the Aurelian Walls at the intersection of Via Campania and Via Abruzzi, almost directly behind the Colossal Juno. Um, and note the SPQR, however, embedded in the marble pieces. Well, Carlo Dossi, in his posthumous Nota Azzurra, Blue Notes, tells an anecdote, and dated to May 1885, and whatever its veracity, must relate not just to Rodolfo Boncompagni Ludovisi and his disposition of the Villa Ludovisi, the, the names are suppressed, but in fact to this very album of photographs. Rodolfo's interlocutor on this occasion is none other than Theodor Mommsen, the winner of the 1902 Nobel Prize for Literature, and by common agreement, the greatest modern historian of ancient Rome who has ever lived. Well, here's Dossi. May 1885. Theodore Mommsen, invited to a pompous breakfast given in his honor by the Prince of Piombino, at the table showed himself to be taciturn and frowning, contrary to his usual nature. After breakfast, the prince, surrounded by archaeologists and other learned men, presented several photographs to Momsen and begged him to accept them. They were photographs of the famous Villa Ludovisi, consisting of plantings three centuries old. A villa, which as you know, so said Prince Boncompagni Ludovisi to the German historian, that will soon disappear. When he saw that an unsmiling Momsen, with a wave of his hand, refused those images, he said, But Professor, take them. They are a keepsake. And Momsen sternly replied, I did not know that the princes, Bon Compagnie Ludovici, made themselves photograph their own disgraceful acts. And the prince, Bon Compagnie Ludovici, gasped. He seemed thunderstruck. 